we uh, experience stresses and these stresses cause a stress response. And this response can be both physical and psychological. So the psychological response is a anticipation or the experience of adversity coming from the stressor. Whereas physical is, it basically relates to the changes in hormones that affect our flight or fight response. For example, one of these hormones that's typically considered the stress hormone is cortisol. And um, when this gets really high, it's actually shown that during a fat loss phase, it increases muscle loss and decreases fat loss. So these, if stress is high, they can absolutely have a negative impact on the results that you get from a nutrition plan. Inter we have two types of stress. We have internal stress, which is something basically you create internally, like neg negative self-talk. For example, I'm not strong enough to reach my goals. And then we have external stress. And basically they're out of our control and there's something that happens to us. So for example, a lost wallet or getting held back from work and back at work and we miss a meal from our plan. Um, but it's important that both of these get managed. Um, how do we manage the internal stress? So daily journal and recording daily experiences and the feelings that you get um, can sometimes uh, basically just help you to bring yourself back down to earth and not getting caught up with sort of swirling thoughts um, within your mind. Um, what I also find super effective is each day taking some time to write things down that you are thankful for, basically like a gratitude diary. And once you bring yourself back down to earth and appreciate some of the things that you are thankful for and some of the things you are lucky for, then the negative feelings and negative self-talk can sometimes subside. Exercise is a good one. Um, just going for a jog, going for a walk, it can, it can relieve internal tension. And for some people, depending on sort of if it's not too high intensity, it can give feelings of euphoria. And that can, be, that can um, greatly reduce internal stress. And then if those aren't working, maybe therapy. So therapy helps you to identify the unhealthy thought patterns and put in place stress management techniques. How do we manage the external stress? Talking, talking is a big one. So it sounds kind of lame, but sharing struggles is, is a huge, huge stress reliever. Um, it, it can allow you to feel like you're getting things off your chest to allow someone else to share the load with you, especially if there's a friend or a family member, so you don't have to sort of take on all these burdens by yourself. Sharing things with family or friend can also, um, they, they, when, once they put their input, um, it can sometimes help you to see things from a different perspective which can have a positive effect. Basic stress relief techniques, using a squish ball, slowing yourself down, just taking 10 deep breaths and trying to bring yourself back to the moment and not getting caught up in sort of um, the, the swirling thoughts of stress. Or one that I like to do if I'm, if I'm super stressed is just going out on the boxing bag for five or 10 minutes and just sort of le leaving everything out in the bag and then you come back inside, you feel like you just, a, a weight was lifted off your shoulders. We can also make permanent changes if we know that a frequent source of external stress is, uh, is if it can be identified. For example, you might have a really toxic workplace which is causing you stress. Perhaps your social circle or your, fr or your friends are putting you in environments that you're not comfortable with and engaging in behaviours that you're not comfortable with. Or maybe it's really not un unhappy with your relationship and that's causing you um, uh, really high amounts of stress and it's being a toxic relationship. Um, if you can identify those causes of the stress, perhaps a, a better option is, is to leave those uh, relationships. Stress is unavoidable. Um, we can put all these stress techniques in place, but 
it's it's only going to minimize the harm. We can't don't we can't go in thinking that that uh, stress is not going to be encountered. Um, expect that it will be encountered, and then the the emotional response is likely to be reduced. Stress and decision making. So, making lots of decisions each day is stressful, and it has a high mental energy cost. When we make lots of decisions, it's called decision fatigue. Our decision making capacity is finite, meaning it's limited. And once it gets drained, our poor decisions, um, poor decisions become more likely. For example, let's say that on a regular work day, you have your break, you, you follow your breakfast on plan, and then uh, you get to work, and at morning tea, uh, the work, the, someone at the office comes around bringing donuts around. And decision fatigue is quite low at that point because it's early in the day, so you, you can say, no, I'm fine, I'll just have my normal meals, and you avoid that. Um, then maybe later on in the day, um, one of your colleagues say, hey, do you wanna go grab a coffee? And you go out with them and get a coffee, and then they say, hey, do you wanna share this cake with me? and you say, no, sorry, I'm, I'm good. And then maybe that, uh, couple that with a few other smaller decisions made in the day, by the time you, that you get to sort of the end of the day and you're driving home from work and you're in the car thinking, okay, what should I have for dinner? Because your decision fatigue is so high, your decision-making capacity is drained, you make a poor decision and you say, screw it, I'm getting McDonald's tonight. We can reduce stress by making less decisions. Uh, ways we can do this is by following a meal plan. So not having to choose what you're going to make for every meal every day uh, and having regular eating, eating times. So you say, okay, uh, I know what I'm gonna eat at, eat at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., 7 p.m. And then there's very little decision that has to be made. Um, I often find athletes, uh, big fans of making the uh, as few decisions as possible. They, they like to be in the camp of, listen, just tell me what I have to eat and when I have to eat it and I'll do it. Um, uh, I'm not sure if, they're, if, if they have some fatigue coming from, psychological fatigue coming from other components, like having to push themselves really hard during their training and sort of push past mental barriers that perhaps they don't have that residual capacity to deal with decision makings in their nutrition. Maybe that's why. Um, but I do find that they like to make as few decisions as possible. Um, another good one can be pre-selecting uh, a restaurant meal if you know that you're gonna be going out for a, a, a meal. Uh, so let's say you, your family says, hey, we've got auntie's uh, birthday dinner tonight, and then a few hours before you jump on the online menu and you pick something, you make sure that there's something on the menu that you can eat, um, and that fits roughly with, with your goals. Having a shopping list, don't, especially if you're super hungry, um, if you're walking endlessly through the shopping store and, and sort of picking up every packet to see how, what the calories and the macros are in it um, and things like that, that can just be an enormous time waster. Whereas if you go in with a fixed list of things that you have to get, you don't wander through all the aisles, you go to the specific spots where you know the foods are kept. Telling people that you're sort of on a diet, especially to your close friend circles, is, is a pretty good idea because once they understand, there's gonna be less like the likelihood of them saying, hey, do you wanna have a slice of pizza? Or, hey, do you wanna drink? Or, hey, do you wanna go out for cake? Um, that you, you, which essentially means that you're not put in, in situations where you have to make frequent decisions. And I'll just make as a final point, and those, those decisions can be extremely st stressful in, them, in, um, in themselves because it could be at a time where maybe you're deep in a fat loss phase and your hunger is really, really high and you'd like nothing more than to have a slice of chocolate cake and your friend says, hey, do you want a slice of chocolate cake? And deep down, you know you want it so bad, but you're, t you're fighting with this, um, basically your angels and demons to say to say no to that uh, and not listening to, to the demon and, and, and sticking uh, and exerting a discipline, which can be tough to do. And, and, and sometimes even saying no to it 
um, the stress is still there because um, it just having having to be like having to say no to it, and then thinking later, oh, that chocolate cake would be so damn nice. That can that can be an issue. So, informing your friends from the outset and your family members so they don't put um, as much pressure on you. So, how does stress relate to nutrition? You can probably already imagine that that they're quite heavily related. High acute stress, which means stress in the short term, that can lead to emotional eating, um, basically seeking pleasure, or it might lead to a complete quitting of the program. So really common examples might be breaking up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, and then the immediate reaction is, I want some comfort, screw the diet, I'm gonna binge tonight. Um, this can often result in irregular eating patterns, like having big meals really late at night before bed. Um, it also means eating in absence of hunger. So you're not eating because you're hungry or because you need nutrition, you're just eating for out of emotion or for comfort. Um, and snacking can sometimes increase quite heavily. And there's been studies to show that high stress is linked to more snacking. And snacking is quite dangerous because these are really small meals that can sometimes have quite a lot of calories. And if you're just picking away at it throughout the day, those calories can, can add up quite significantly without you realizing it. Higher acute stress can also lead to undereating. So we just talked about how it can lead to overeating, but it can also lead to undereating. Um, I think all of us would be able to relate to one time or another where maybe something really bad's happened in our life or um, we're just really, really stressed out and our appetite is just squashed. Um, now, high chronic stress, which is stress that has been around for a long time, um, that can lead to anxiety, depression, and anger. And when these are enforced, um, it may turn to basically you're seeking comfort foods more regularly in, in an attempt to self-medicate because everyone gets these short-term fix of sort of euphoria and the serotonin release after these junk foods, but it's only very t short-term lived. It doesn't deal with the core of the problem. Um, whatever's causing your stress and your anxiety and depression is still going to be there, um, which is why it can be a nasty cycle where you're all, always looking for that short-term fix. The low stress is linked with higher self-confidence, important when trying to engage in, a, in any sort of diet intervention. And if stress is regular and severe, eating behavior and motivation can be compromised. Uh, this usually results in overeating, but sometimes undereating, and low intensity or sometimes a complete layoff from training, which can lead to negative body composition outcomes. So basically that's just a summary sentence of, of what we've just discussed. When following any diet, we should make attempts to reduce the stress of the diet and strategies should be put in place to deal with unavoidable stresses. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, guys. This was a stress and nutrition lecture from the Fundamental Series in our all-new education portal. This portal is a learning hub for all health and fitness enthusiasts. If you want to know more about the portal, see the link below. And stay tuned for next week's video.